Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Andrew O'Shaughnessy. I'm the Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, which is the research arm of Monticello. And it's my pleasure today to be introducing the inaugural Sardowski Lecture in memory and commemoration of the life and scholarship of Leonard Sadowski. During my first year as director in 2003, Leonard was here as a one-year Gilda Lerman Fellow. A gifted scholar, he was turning his manuscript into his first book, Revolutionary Negotiations, Indians and Empires and Diplomats in the Founding of America. My fondest memory of him was in Salzburg, of Sound of Music fame. Uh, it was in uh, 2005, and during the glorious weather, he would spend interludes cycling around the lake or walking overlooked by the Schloss Leopoldskron. Jim Sofka, his former supervisor, uh, cannot join us today, but wrote some reminiscences for me to share, and I'm just going to give expert SERPs, but I'd be happy to share the full letter with anyone. It was a privilege to come to know Leonard. He quickly caught my attention as an unusually sophisticated student of the late 18th century international system with a command of sources preternatural for his age. He would stop by my office for long chats, and we often discussed sources and methodologies. When he asked me to serve on his committee, I was both touched and inspired. While reading drafts of theses uh, can often be painful labor, in Leonard's case, it was pure intellectual joy and led me to reflect upon and occasionally vigorously challenge my own interpretations. What was most striking about Leonard's work was its fluidity across disciplines and concepts. Nevertheless, the very durability of his work carries more than a pang of sadness. I'll never forget an evening with him in Salzburg in which he outlined a comprehensive, accurate, and detailed typology of schools of thought of 18th century international relations and early American foreign policy entirely off the cuff with an energy that would have overwhelmed improv actors while sipping a drink, listening to him work through decades of scholarship and how it informed his own work. I vividly recall that it could have been published and almost certainly accurately cited as a spoken stream of consciousness. I personally remember Leonard most for his integrity, his gift of friendship, and his strong work ethic, in which he was immensely productive in a relatively very short academic career. It's a pleasure to have his mother with us today, Joanna uh, Sardowski. I don't know if she would like to stand. Uh, and his grandmother, Genevieve Robb. And for them to be with us as we uh, honor the memory of one whose untimely loss we still grieve. They're joined by some of his fellow graduate contemporaries, uh, including Rob Parker and uh, uh, Ben Karp and Krista Dirk Seedy. We also have many more online. Uh, I know that Annette Gordon-Reed, who's one of our trustees here at Monticello, is joining us online, and uh, we're delighted to have them. And we're also very grateful to them and to any of those of you in the audience who've contributed to the endowment of this lectureship. However, it was Peter Onuf, his supervisor, who first suggested the lecture to uh, honor Leonard. They both collaborated on a book while Gr Leonard was still a graduate student, an excellent book on Jeffersonian 
America. The last time that I saw Leonard was when he was here for a conference. It was essentially uh, to commemorate uh, Peter's own retirement. Uh, this lecture has been a long time in the making. It was supposed to occur in 2020, and it was canceled due to COVID. It has been canceled subsequently. A friend and mentor to many of us, Peter has been the driving force in organizing and coordinating with family members. I told him I never think of him as someone interested in the details of administration, but he's been more than interested. Uh, he is now going to introduce our guest speaker, Hannah Spahn, who's traveled to give this lecture from Germany. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for being here today. This is a very important day for me and for Joanne and the Sadowski family, and I'm delighted that it's finally happening. We've been thinking about Leonard all these years, the gratification of finally having the opportunity to commemorate him and to come together in his honor has been deferred gratification that's supposed to be better according to the Protestant work ethic. Uh, my hope is that Monticello and Andrew and the ICJS will continue to support this series. It's a great opportunity to bring distinguished scholars to Charlottesville uh, to give us a, a preview of some of the best new work and it's been a great period, partly thanks to Andrew, and Andrew has been really important in the history of Jefferson studies, the modern period when that book is written by Frank Cogliano and his dotage as a sequel to <laughs> Just Between Us, uh, that the years, the, they'll call them the O'Shaughnessy years, when we went on the most absurd junkets to the most ridiculous places and at a wonderful time but it was all in the interests of and promoted Jefferson scholarship. And nobody was happier to be a part of that Republic of Letters that Andrew helped us sustain over the years than Leonard Sadowski, my former co-author. Leonard was a fine scholar, as you've heard Jim Sofka's recollections. He was also, in my estimation, one of the best people I've ever known in my life. And he is sadly and sorely missed. He loved this world, and I don't think anybody in it loved it more than Leonard did. Well, our first speaker in this series will be a hard one to match in the future, but that's the challenge to young Jefferson scholars. Do something as good as what Hannah Spahn has done. She's the author of a wonderful book about Jefferson and time and history, uh, published in 2012. And now you are going to get a sneak preview of a book. I keep telling her this, and she's, we've, we've talked a lot about how I actually introduce her. Um, and I shouldn't overhype it, but I can't help but tell you that this book she's about to publish and I want Nadine to bring it out much faster than she's planning to, will change everything in our understanding of Jefferson. And it might even be a valuable intervention in our stupid culture wars today. It's about the ongoing conversation and engagement of African-American writers with Thomas Jefferson. Some people now think we can do without Thomas Jefferson. Anna Schwann's going to show us why those people who suffered most 
and on into the modern period, has sustained the real promise of the Enlightenment. It's a great personal pleasure to introduce a great friend of mine and a wonderful young scholar, and all of you these days are young, <laughs> Hannah Spahn. It's a very great honor for me to, today to give the Leonard J. Sadowski Memorial Lecture. So let me first also say a few words on the name giver of this lecture. Leonard's work, I think, sorry, no, I totally forgot. Okay. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> it was truly outstanding, as we've heard already. These are just his three books, not to mention his articles and other books. However, today I'd like to think more broadly about Leonard, not merely as a historian, but also as a colleague and friend. I still remember meeting Leonard in this very room, in the library on my very first fellowship at the at CJS in 2003. When I look back, I see Leonard as someone who was not alone, but typically, as we already heard in Edwin's uh, introduction, engaged in conversation with myself, but also with many other people, both personally and in writing, and I recently had this um, touching moment for me personally when I went through the papers of the late um, Peter Nikolaisen, after whom a fellowship is also named here, and I keep the papers in my basement, I was looking for something, and I accidentally uh, found an email that Leonard had written to Peter, and that Peter had printed out, because he apparently considered it to be so precious, it was the only email there, and for me this, this was a sad but also beautiful moment. And I saw the, the uh, conversation between the two Jeffersonians and continuing in writing. Um, it was Leonard's characteristic style of communication that he loved to share his own independent thinking, while also remaining respectful of other people's differences, ready to bridge political, conventional, and many other differences, and to give even unorthodox arguments some advance credit. As Leonard Sadowski thus embodied the ideal of enlightened dialogue for me, an ideal I also found um, held especially high at the ICJS and in the Jefferson Studies community, and that has always drawn me back here, I would like to describe Jeff uh, Leonard's legacy today as that of a late representative of what I discuss in the book as the Jeffersonian Enlightenment. Now note that I say Jeffersonian Enlightenment, not Jefferson's Enlightenment. My book is essentially on the difference between the two, which are clearly related, but not the same. Jefferson, as we all know, is one of very few Americans whose name is convertible into an adjective and an ism to denote a worldview em emerging with, but going beyond the scope of his own ideas, comparable to Newtonianism or Cartesianism or Marxism. The Jeffersonian enlightenment is thus not only what Jefferson himself said, sometimes even not what Jefferson said, but rather, what many other people made of it. In the book, I approach Jefferson's special uh, version of Enlightenment philosoph philosophy historically and uh, seek to trace its historical evolution in the uh, into the Jeffersonian Enlightenment through the work of 19th century African-American intellectuals, who I argue played the most influential part in, his, in this transformation from Jefferson's Enlightenment to the Jeffersonian Enlightenment. I should probably make clear um, at this point, if it hasn't become clear already, that along with my historical approach, I also see the Jeffersonian Enlightenment as a trans-historical, trans-generational ideal, able at best to provide core values that can still hold together our uh, societies. At the center of the Jefferson, uh, Jeffersonian Enlightenment, as I see it, is the idea of open-minded communication in the search of a knowledge that may rarely be reached, but that as an aspiration can provide the common ground for our discussions. Put, it, put it in practice, this ideal has always been difficult, and it may be especially difficult um, at the present moment. On the one hand, of course, from such extremely brutal forms of illiberalism as in the current Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, 
but on the other hand, also from the increasing political polarization within our own societies, which so often seems to prevent real open-minded discussion, as I found it um, personified by Leonard. However, to deal with the various crises that we are currently facing in geopolitics, the climate, the economy, energy, health, etc., it seems to me existentially important never to give up the common ground made available to us by the ideals of the Jeffersonian Enlightenment. With this ideal vision, I depart some way from the negative critique of the Enlightenment that, come, that came to dominate large parts of the humanities in the last century. Namely, the disillusioned view that the Enlightenment consisted of nothing really but a bunch of white males who used such universalist values as reason, liberty, and free discussion for little else than to camouflage their oppression of the rest of the world through slavery, colonialism, and racism. As a German, I grew up with this negative critique of Enlightenment universalism because although it tends to present itself as radically new and subversive, its intellectual foundations actually go back a very long way, not only to the radical questioning of the Enlightenment in French post-structuralism, postmodernism more broadly, but in the final anal analysis also to long-standing problems, especially in German intellectual history. And a very German anti-Kantian um, anti opposition to Enlightenment philosophy, which ushered in an in part leftist, but in part also quite reactionary critique of so-called Western rationalism. What has long fascinated me in the history of the American Enlightenment is that it was an enlightenment without Kant, Hegel, etc., that nevertheless, miraculously, also managed to arrive in the 19th century. Uh, astonishing from my perspective. So my basic research question already in my first book was how on earth do you guys do that? And then secondly, how does one break the news to today's cultural or post-colonial theorists who still tend to work with a dated image of the European Enlightenment that was at the origins of the critical tradition that I just outlined, in which neither black nor white Americans played any formative roles. Ironically, a deeply Eurocentric image of the Enlightenment. Now, of course, by focusing on specifically American conditions, I do not want to claim that there were no problems in the American Enlightenment, only that these problems were quite different. Um, for instance, as I'm arguing in part one of my book, Jefferson cannot plausibly be described as a representative of an oppressive Western rationalism, because in historical comparison, his empiricism was at the far end of the anti-rationalist, not anti-reason, but anti-rationalism as a philosophical stance, anti-rationalist tendencies of the British American Enlightenment. Jefferson's enlightened anti-rationalism was condensed in his repeated pun on Descartes' rationalist philosophy. Um, unlike what has become known as the Cartesian cogito, I think, therefore I am, Jefferson proudly proclaimed, I feel, therefore I exist, making feeling, not rational thinking, the basis of his nationalist epistemology, distinguishing Americans from what he thought were their unfeeling brethren in Europe. And it was the anti-rationalism of Jefferson's enlightenment of feeling, his stress on subjective affect, opinion, prejudice, sometimes even ignorance, rather than the pretension to scientific knowledge, that was at the heart of his construction of race in Notes on the State of Virginia, and of his racism too. Yeah? He, described, he himself described it as prejudice, and in the end, feeling, not reason. Meanwhile, as I'm arguing in part two, Jefferson's African-American interlocutors could hardly have been further from being the intellectually passive victims of Western rationalism, as which they are still so, not so rarely depicted today. To the contrary, they often had the best insight and motivation to develop strong concepts of reason and full knowledge to highlight and counteract the weaknesses of Jefferson's enlightenment of feeling and the limits of its universalism. Thus, my book's title, Black Reason, White Feeling, has a polemical intent. I do not wish to suggest, of course, that either human reason or human feeling are more black or white. Instead, I want to illustrate my book's thesis that by their insistence on reason and rational dialogue, African-American intellectuals of the long 19th century 
played decisive roles in the formation of both Jefferson's posthumous image and the repertory of values that is familiar to us as the Jeffersonian, not Jefferson's, but the Jeffersonian Enlightenment. Therefore, wholesale associations of the Enlightenment and Enlightenment values in general with whiteness or even white supremacy and racism make very little sense to me. To make this clear, my book follows the conversation of two different specifically American versions of Enlightenment philosophy, which I label Jefferson's Enlightenment of Feeling and Wheatley's Enlightenment of Principle. Uh, called Wheatley's Enlightenment of Principle, what can roughly be called a high-end approach to enlightenment that grounded its universalism in ambitious concepts of reason and knowledge, placing high intellectual and moral demands on the individual. It differed from enlightenment traditions in Europe in that it already had to find ways of dealing with the problems of Jefferson's post-colonial, post-revolutionary enlightenment of feeling which may be, be described as a low-key approach to enlightenment that prided itself on offering a democratic American alternative to what Jefferson called the wretched philosophy of Europe and the useless, this was an important term for him as opposed to useful knowledge, useless hierarchies of European metaphysics. And metaphysics was a very negative term for him. In the place of strong concepts of knowledge, Jefferson's enlightenment tended to valorize opinion, subjective certainty rather than full knowledge, secular faith, and what he liked to call creed. Yeah, he loved the term creed. He spoke of his political, materialist, and um, uh, rational creed, rational creed being his religion. The epistemolo epistemological flexibility, a laissez-faire of opinion and creed, provoked the writers of Wheatley's Enlightenment to respond with more rigorous appeals to rationality. The dialectical outcome of their efforts to discipline and rein in the excesses of Jefferson's anti-rationalism, I argue, was today's ideal of the Jeffersonian Enlightenment, which I see as the synthesis, or many different syntheses, of these two philosophies. Yeah? You cannot have one without the other, as I see it. Now, the personal relationship between Wheatley and Jefferson was relatively one-sided. When Jefferson was writing notes on the state of Virginia, Wheatley was a transatlantic celebrity, counting, for instance, both George Washington and George III among her many admirers. However, like Jefferson's own wife briefly before, she tragically died in late 1784 in childbed at the age of only 33. While Wheatley thus no longer had to deal with Jefferson, he apparently still felt very much compelled to deal with her. Query 14, entitled Laws of Notes on Virginia, has become notorious for Jefferson's racism, illustrated in his performance of dismissing Wheatley's name and reputation, <laughs> arguably the morally and intellectually lowest point of his writings. Although Jefferson received a great deal of criticism for it, also by his white peers, he never took back what he claimed here. And I quote, religion indeed has produced a Phyllis Waitley, but it could not produce a poet. The compositions published under her name are below the dignity of criticism. As I'm not the first to point out, he artificially introduced as many as four spelling mistakes into the two syllables of her name, which can <laughs> definitely not be an accident anymore. Uh, he thus sought to convey the impression of quoting from a difficult language of a foreign nation that contained not one, but presumably even several Phyllis Waitleys. With this for him uncharacteristically um, complete absence of civility, he wanted to make sure that Phyllis Wheatley, or Waitley as he saw it, and with her all other writers of African descent, were, uh, was as far removed as possible from being a potential partner in enlightened dialogue. Jefferson's main point here was not literary criticism, but the attempt to exclude her and her foreign nation once and for all from the possibility of intellectual exchange. <clears throat> 
By contrast, Jefferson's African-American commentators, the protagonists of my book, defied this communicative restriction and insisted instead on keeping the avenues of enlightened conversation open. As has long been pointed out, Jefferson was the Enlightenment figure and the American president before Lincoln to be most often quoted and discussed by black writers. Not only in the first preserved African-American novel, William Wells Brown's Clotel or the President's Daughter, and the first uh, English edition, at least, is explicitly about Jefferson's interracial family. The later American editions took that aspect um, back. But also in a great number of pamphlets, speeches, letters, sermons, poems, character sketches, slave narratives, newspaper editorials, and essays before and after this novel. This is just uh, the tip of the iceberg up to the Civil War. Typically, the Jefferson character in this archive is not the personification of evil, personification of weakness. What was surprising to me was the extent to which pity and sympathy became a frequent theme in African-American literary treatments of Jefferson. Pity for someone who was not particularly evil, like a B minus, morally speaking, but who didn't fully get it rationally. He didn't fully get it very often. They have to educate, it, educate him in these anecdotes or uh, fictional character sketches. Yeah, thus commentators from Daniel Coker to James McEwen Smith and William Wilson undermined the polarized cliche of Jefferson as the mastermind. Jefferson for them was neither simply the quasi superhuman thinker nor simply the subhuman evil master, but something more realistic in between the two poles of the mastermind. There were several important clusters of ideas in which the writers of Wheatley's Enlightenment crucially shaped the values of today's Jeffersonian Enlightenment. For instance, as I'm going to show soon in my conclusion, they were among the first to consistently offer today's dominant interpretation of what came to be known um, through their work as the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Using the term principle in the universalist sense in which Wheatley had introduced it in a widely published letter in 1774, while Jefferson actually used it in a far more restricted way, for instance, in the Declaration itself, but also in his uh, later correspondence. From early on, moreover, African-American intellectuals insisted on the significance of Jefferson's interracial family, not just in the novel Clotel. Crucially, writers such as Frederick Douglass or James McEwen Smith sought to consolidate a universalist theory of knowledge after Jefferson's post-colonial enlightenment of feeling had, got, got, had gone some way in the opposite direction. On this basis, they pointed out what they saw as the stark logical contradictions between Jefferson's drafting of the Declaration and his slaveholding, between the Declaration and Notes on Virginia, and between query 14 of Notes, his racism, and query 18, his radical indictment of slavery. In the process, they created the literary trope of Jefferson, an originally African-American artifact, as I see it, that served rhetorically as the embodiment of America's internal contradictions as a modern democracy that maintains slavery. Until today, countless historical commentators have followed the writers of Wheatley's Enlightenment in the projection of what might be called a Jeffersonian double consciousness on the historical Jefferson the claim that he was a man of contradictions that we are all familiar with. Yet historically, just as there is no Adam Smith problem between the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, there was no Thomas Jefferson problem from the perspective of his own philosophy. I mean, even query 14 and 18 are part of the same book. To become the best known example of both America's greatest potential and its greatest problem, Jefferson's enlightenment first had to be creatively transformed and overwritten. To conclude, I will now briefly discuss the most famous example of this transformation. Jefferson's nationalist epistemology and his focus on opinion, including the new concept of public opinion in the late 18th century, was intertwined with a habitual emphasis on the situatedness and the ensuing limitations of his own access to knowledge. Part of a self-critical, but at the same time, I would argue from the perspective of this book, potentially self-indulgent, attitude. I used to like his self-criticism very much, but once I began to see him through the eyes of um, African-American writers, I saw that, that it has uh, more than one side. 
Its best, um, best known expression is in the famous first two sentences of the Declaration of Independence that we all know. I've highlighted here the moments when Jefferson's subjectivist stress on opinion rather than knowledge is most apparent. You notice that reason is not a term used in the Declaration. The Declaration's oft described language of compulsion, part I would say of Jefferson's concept of involuntary opinion, claims that the entire declaration is automatically necessitated by an open-ended respect for the opinions of a global public, whether these opinions may, uh, whatever these opinions may be, true or false, doesn't matter. The long sec second sentence mirrors the first on this point, claiming the same decent respect for the opinions also for the American side. Uh, again, for opinions, not knowledge. In the overdetermined phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, what is supposed to be the highest form of certainty, self-evident truths that by definition can stand by themselves without anyone's approval, um, is depicted here as a mere opinion that is collectively held rather than actually known. Jefferson's we hold was a deliberate, deliberate flirtation with uncertainty, something less than knowledge, namely a creed, an uncertainty that could be exploited, unfortunately, by pro-slavery commentators in the 19th century who denounced the phrase as meaningless, glittering generalities. However, Jefferson was willing to forego full certainty because he wanted to use the phrase's weakness for establishing a parallel between the political concept of the consent of the governed and the epistemological concept of the assent to a proposition in order to make Americans become part of the process of declaring themselves independent and thus to mobilize the new American citizenry. The second half of the sentence then proceeds to spell out the full political implications of this weakness, in that both principles and form of government appear to follow not directly from universal truths, but from the contingent historical opinions of American citizens, now, as to them shall seem most likely. Thus, the sentence's second half partly takes back and relativizes the claims of the first half. What is important here? The problem was not the oft discussed question of whether Jefferson meant to include black people in the phrase, all men are created equal. Men in the same draft was capitalized when it referred to the victims of the Atlantic slave trade. What was the problem instead was the intentional weakness of the de declaration's truth claims. Jefferson's Jefferson characteristically left things open and arguably too open. The writers of Wheatley's Enlightenment of Principles saw this problem clearly. From 1776 onwards, African-American intellectuals took responsibility for what they called the principles of the Declaration of Independence, engaging with them and actively transforming their meaning. The African-American hermeneutical tradition of the Declaration went beyond the historical limitations of such principles as were specified near the end of the Declaration's second phrase. Instead, from the beginning, it focused on the today as a result of these interventions, much better known beginning of the phrase, which of course does not originally contain the term principle. So one could say to move back, they, they basically moved the term principle up from the an end of the phrase to the beginning. Um, Yeah, uh, where was I? Unimpressed by the characteristic blend of humility and arrogance in Jefferson's stress on opinion, they privileged privilege the authority of full knowledge um, of what James Fortin in 1813, for instance, called rational liberty, yeah? a term that Jefferson didn't use in that context. To take another example, in 1779, black petitioners in New Hampshire made it clear that they did not merely think, feel, or opine. They professed to know that the God of nature made us free. As early as 1776, the manuscript essay Liberty Further Extended or Free Thoughts on the Illegality of Slavery by Lemuel Haynes, a black minister to white Connecticut congregations, um, inaugurated this transformative reception history. His essay opened with an abridgment of the Declaration's most famous sentence that no longer looks innovative, but only because it has anticipated later uses of the phrase so precisely that the alteration is being taken granted for uh, today. Arguably, most people all over the world still know the phrase best in the truncated version of Haynes's epigraph from 1776. 
quoted, only from we hold these truths until life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1776, Haynes did not him inscribe himself into a hegemonic discourse, I would argue. It hadn't yet become hegemonic by, by then, but actually contributed decisively to shaping it, to creating it. His quotation is most remarkable for the parts of the original it radically silenced. In one bold move, Haynes downplayed the Declaration's original stress on collective assent. In a similar vein, it reduced the communal aspect of the Declaration's rights claims, as well as Jefferson's relativization of the terms principle and form. Haynes's truncated version froze the phrases inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness into the status of extra historical universals. What for Jefferson had been a safety and happiness that were historically relative problems of subjective opinion, in Haynes's influential abridgment became a matter of timeless truth and absolute knowledge. To conclude, in the course of the 19th century, what may be called the Haynes abridgment began to travel through African American literature and American literature more broadly, of course, appearing in countless texts of various genres, almost exclusively in this truncated form. In relation to this version of the sentence, Jefferson's racism and his slaveholding now stood in direct opposition. Moreover, against the backdrop of a rigorously universalist epistemology, stressing reason and rational dialogue, he now appeared to be a man who could and should have known better. On these grounds, the narrative of the Jeffersonian American contradictions could develop. On the 4th of July, 1827, the day slavery was abolished in New York, the black abolitionist William Hamilton accordingly described Jefferson as, and I quote, an ambidexter philosopher who can reason contrarywise. First tells you that all men are created equal and that they are endowed with the unalienable rights of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Next proof, proves um, then one class of men um, are not equal to another, which by the by does not agree with axioms in geometry that deny that things can be equal and at the same, same time unequal to one another. What Hamilton regarded as Jefferson's illogical and irrational thinking clearly did, did not qualify as a true love of knowledge. And I quote him again, true philosophy teaches that a man should act in conformity to his reason and reason and the law of God and nature declare that all men are equal and that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are their inalienable rights. What in Jefferson's declaration had been declared by colonists becoming citizens as an emotional, communally shared opinion on the epistemological status of equal creation, in Hamilton's universalist ethics had become transformed into full equality declared by reason itself. Thank you. So, Heather, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this will be a great book. And I know your uh, editor, and my editor, is in the audience, not Zim Zimili. <laughs> Uh, so we're delighted to have you, and it's a good acquisition for the University of Virginia Press, <laughs> uh, which where, of course, was where Leonard also published. Um, I, I've always thought the most powerful uh, response by an African-American was Benjamin Banneker, the mathematician, and his letter to Jefferson, in which he really asked him the $100 million dollar question which everyone asks since, how could you write this phrase for men are created mm -hmm. equal and why have you failed not to act on it? Uh, I must say it has always puzzled me because according to Pauline Mayer, virtually no one knew until the late 1790s that Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and yet somehow, because mm -hmm. uh, sure. that letter dates from the early 1790s, I just throw that out there in case someone can mm -hmm. respond. Uh, when writing to his um, nephew, he says famously, let reason be your guide. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is perhaps one of his most famous letters on religion. Uh, he tells his nephew to be skeptical, essentially to question mm -hmm. everything except nothing, even if uh, it leads you to really not believing mm -hmm. in divinity. 
Um, and my question to you, because uh, you know, you've made me think much more <laughs> deeply about Jefferson's thinking process and just sort of talking about his emphasis on rationalism, mm -hmm. is when the, is he going to choose to be <laughs> base his thinking on reason and when emotion, uh, why not subject race to exactly the same scrutiny, these racial opinions, as religion? And how did he make that choice? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. <laughs> um, I would also say, of course, in, in the context of religion, he sounds most, well, not like a rationalist either, but he sounds, his appeals to reason are strongest. Yeah, he's talking yes. about his rational creed but still even in religion if i understood it correctly it's sort of reason doesn't distinguish between true belief and you know false belief yeah so it's more for him it's it's more meant as as a weapon to um sort of counteract outside forces established churches yeah this is the function of reason it's not in the processes in the mind yeah, and so that that is um, where even in religion, where he sounds where, of course, he's often talking about reason, Jefferson, right? But it depends a little bit on what he does with the concept. And often he, for instance, qualifies it by um, possessive prono pronouns. He tells Adams, my reason is telling you something different from your reason, yeah, which is <laughs> difficult, yeah. In a way, he uses it interchangeably for uh, with um, other terms such as understanding, um, honesty, common sense, it's, they all appear in the same places. Very often he uses reason together with um, another, um, uh, like, uh, and free government reason and education reason. And, and it's usually the other term that is more interesting. And if you uh, leave reason out of the sentence, nothing happens. Yeah? So with a rationalist, that wouldn't be the case. Um, and so the question, why uh, religion and not race? Um, yeah, because he really, um, as he argued in, in Notes on the State of Virginia, um, it's in, in query 14, he is admitting that, he, that white um, uh, Virginians are prejudiced. It's not their reason that tells them that uh, they want to separate from um, uh, blacks, as he is trying to argue in, in the book, um, that they should do that. But it's their feelings and there's a kind of gut reaction. Feeling for him is not sentiment. It's not uh, sort of civilized necessarily. It's, it's really the sense of touch. And he wants to sort of keep the two, what, what he sees as two races apart. And it's not a rational argument. It's really an argument based on feeling. Uh, and this, that's a good example uh, because it would help explain why he was open to the idea of an afterlife. You know, based right. on feeling and intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. that, uh, yeah. Yes. And reason cannot answer that. Yeah. And yet he still really wants evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. And there's sort of an <laughs> empirical approach. Empirical uh, evidence. Yeah. Yes. Um, right. So it is, I, mean, I don't think one can really come up with an answer in a short term. But, yeah. Uh, it is fascinating. Yes. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, here at UVA. <laughs> oh, no, thanks. Thank you. Um, so my my question was about the audiences of the 19th mm -hmm. century writers that, that you're talking mm -hmm. about, because as, as you mentioned, um, the, the ways that they uh, approached Jefferson and the ways that they wrote about him weren't necessarily uh, condemnatory, but were more a, a sort a sense of pity um, but I wonder if you can get give us any sense of how much that had to do with the with the Jeffersonian Enlightenment versus just knowing their audience that in the 19th century um, in Whig history that they're not going to attack Jefferson in the same way that we might you know here in come the 20th century. Yeah, thank you. Very good question about the audience. I mean, today we, we know much more about these um, audiences. We also know that very often it was African-American audiences that these texts were written for. Yeah, They were not necessarily written for white audiences. And then if you think pity, I mean, this, this was not a moderate argument. Pity implies, and also sympathy in a way, but it's the same word in a way, but it implies a hierarchy. 
And if you pity someone, you look down. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not really uh, just to please white audience or to be moderate because then they can um, sort of appeal to their readers more. But sometimes it's also to to appeal to black audiences. I would say. Yeah. But very important question. No? Of course, he was very emotional, generally, and mm -hmm. especially in his hatreds. And this right. obsession with George the Third and blaming him. <laughs> For everything, including England's entering into the slave trade, which began, you know, a century and a half more earlier. Yeah, if you read the draft mm. of the Declaration of mm. Independence and the unfeeling brethren and the last step to agonizing affection and so on, mm. that is not reason speaking, right? Mm. It's mm. Very emotional. No? Mm -hmm. Anna, could you explain a little bit about prejudice? Why would Jefferson mm -hmm. capitulate to prejudice? Why does he even acknowledge his own prejudice, as you read him carefully? Mm -hmm. uh, if we just think of him in isolation of the context within which he operated, we say this is simply a, a failure. Uh, as Andrew's question mm -hmm. suggests, why approach this problem differently? What, what is, is it, uh, we like to think, because we are very righteous these days, that he's guilty of something. He's a hypocrite. His self-interest dominates. Uh, is there an argument for prejudice? What would Jefferson say? Yeah, very important question about um, uh, prejudice. I mean, it's he he kinds of uh, uh, kind of um, sells it as a sort of pleasant self-criticism, like he's aware of his prejudice, and this is very frequent in the late Enlightenment that you say there is no greater prejudice than mm. not being aware of your prejudices and so on. So as a man of the late Enlightenment, it's it's kind of also part of his civility to to admit to it, but there is, is more to this. And in, in notes on Virginia, he is really uh, trying sort of not to be better than the the other citizens as, as in a monarchy. Yeah. In the Republic, it has to be on a, on a in, in his mind, he was really occupied with that. You have to take um, seriously the citizens' opinions and potentially also their prejudices. You cannot look down on them. You cannot say like uh, Frederick II um, of Prussia, you know, prejudices are the reason of the people and uh, great if, if the people are prejudiced because then I, as an enlightened monarch, can, can govern better. Yeah? I can manipulate them better. And this is not uh, what Jefferson, what Jefferson thinks. So prejudice has a different, um, plays a different role in in a more democratic culture of knowledge in America. And it's really, I, I was surprised in this project how consistent he is on these on these questions of opinion, how how deeply that concerned him. Yeah, and he's very meticulous in separating opinion. Uh, Query fourteen is a very good example. Suspicion, conjecture, you know, all these different levels um, in relation to knowledge. And um, the problem, um, or sort of in the late enlightenment, you often see sort of more um, yeah, moderate approaches to prejudice that you say you, ca you cannot um, attack it directly as a man of the enlightenment, you sort of also have to admit to it. But um, this in the 19th century, as I argue in the book, evolved into um, a sort of self-indulgence in, in the in the white colonizationist arguments of white colonizationists that they said from the beginning and also referring back to Jefferson directly. So it was really a very influential um, a part of notes on the, uh, Virginia, the like very 14 prejudice. And they said, we as uh, Americans, as white Americans cannot help but be prejudiced. We are all prejudiced as a group. So they admitted to their prejudice, but they used that as an argument sort of group prejudice that they, they could not evade um, to say, therefore, uh, blacks need to go. Therefore, they, because we are so prejudiced, they need to go. So it's a form of self-criticism that actually uh, becomes, uh, yeah, a sort of a really harmful argument. Um, and the, you can really see in, in Jefferson, prejudice is at least ambivalent and he's hoping at some point it will go away, mm -hmm. just not quickly enough for whites and blacks to, 
uh, live peacefully together, civil war would be too likely, so therefore he was also for separation. But white colonizationists in the 19th century really say prejudice Race, prejudice of color, prejudice was basically the term for racism. Prejudice is God sent. This is who we are, whites, we are defined by our prejudice. So people like Frederick Douglass then had to counteract this argument and say, no, this is not the entire group of white people and there is something you can do about it. Yeah, it's not that the two races have to be separate. And this is um, today the, the argument has changed. Yeah, we think if, if we, we think of prejudice as an individual problem, then people are being accused of being colorblind or not, not sort of progressive enough. But in the 19th century, it was the colonizationists who made the, the um, collectivist claim and African-American abolitionists who focus on the individual as a, as a way to counteract that. He no. supposedly revised query 14 and added this language of emotion later in response to an abolitionist who read it and said, this is going to mm. undermine abolition uh, if you state so boldly that mm -hmm. there's a difference in race. Does that in any way change your argument? Uh, yeah, you've about, told me that before yes, and I yes. find it very important. Yes. Um, but it's it's not an isolated. Uh, he he mm. often does it in other mm. ways. It, it's it's true. It's it's kind of going the safe road of mm. of sort of saying, okay, I'm not I'm not dogmatic here. Yeah, it's the self criticism. This is what I mean by self indulgent. It kind of makes it easy. Sure, mm. this may not be true, but I just throw mm. it out there. Um, yeah. So it's. I think he increased it, but at some point he he never uh, took back anymore. I mean, he could have gone further. Yeah, and he didn't change that later at all. Yeah, so it all, he it got stuck in that. It also that includes level. misquotes, and misinformation about the Romans, and so mm, much, right. so much so we had a fellow here mm. questioning whether he really could read these ancient languages. Uh, <laughs> and my point to her is that when you have a particular point of view, you tend to see it. Uh, and you find reinforcement. And I can give other examples of Jefferson doing that uh, and being highly selective. Right, and African Americans mm. made very much fun of this Roman comparison. It was directed yes. against mm. Montesquieu, and then people like James McEwen Smith said, you know, mm. the same thing, like, like mm. the fellow here. <laughs> More or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then. Uh, yes. And then Krista. Yeah, I wanted to pose a historiographical question. To what degree do 20th and 21st century scholars give the, this, uh, these 19th century African-American intellectuals their due, right? Like you, you've now you know, pu pulled all of this together in terms of this critique of Jeffersonianism, but is there a, a longer tail to it? Yes, definitely. I think there is, and that has also drawn me to the field as sort of my second major field. I think there is a very sophisticated historical research on uh, 19th century African American literature in the last 20 years or so. For, for, for a long time, it was the slave narrative, and now we know so much more about black audiences, about different genres, uh, other than the slave narrative. It's becoming very, very sophisticated. But I think, you know, in in, in Germany, the, my field is American studies, and I think if you go outside of the historical research into sort of broader discussions of race and so on, this very um, Precise historical research often doesn't have such a wide resonance. Yeah, it's more like our theories about race at the moment that dominate the the discussion. Yeah, so I think it's it's really always worthwhile to to go uh, into the details there. Yeah, but I agree that there has been a lot a lot of excellent research on that. Krista, I think they can pick up people at the front. Is that the idea? The, the Virtual. Yes. Mm. All right. Good. You just here. Oh. Um, thank you, Hannah, for that wonderful talk. Um, mm -hmm. I you brought up um, sort of pro-slavery apologists and their uh, rejection of the Declaration, um, but I'm wondering about the implications for your argument for that group of people. In other words, are they in some ways continuing Jefferson's enlightenment of feeling mm -hmm. in their arguments that uh, slavery is 
is uh, buttressed by public opinion, right? Its extension and expansion is because of a very subjective condition in the southern states mm -hmm. that's exceptional. Mm -hmm. um, and are they, in their rejection of the declaration, inadvertently picking up on Wheatley's enlightenment of principle and identifying at least natural rights or that second paragraph as a principle? Mm -hmm. Ah, very sophisticated question. I have to think about it. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking more about the continuities with uh, the colonizationists, yeah, and sort of the African Americans pick on Jefferson because he's still closest to to their argument. I mean, then there are the colonizationists, and then who are at least against slavery, and then at the end, at the far end of the spectrum, there are pro-slavery arguments, and by sort of uh, criticizing Jefferson or, or playing a little with Jefferson, creating Jefferson characters in the literature. They sort of get rid of all the more racist and pro-slavery stuff. Yeah, so I, I didn't really deal with that much with the pro-slavery arguments. I wouldn't. Yeah, one could probably find a continuities with a feeling with the subjectivist arguments, but there were also uh, sort of economic arguments and so on, where feeling uh, doesn't play perhaps such a role. Yeah, but one that would be an interesting research question, actually. The question is whether I would still use the term enlightenment for that. Probably not necessarily. Yeah, if you. Yeah. I just, it's beyond the purview of the project. I just say that in the spirit of, you know, you, you looked at how African American response and critique of the enlightenment. Of mm -hmm. But I think that there's a parallel story that you, one could tell. This is why your argument is so compelling, is what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? Is that pro slavery apologists are taking it in a different Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Thanks. It's yeah. interesting you're picking up on the ambiguous use of man in the Declaration and how it's also used in the passage on slavery, because he wrote two public education bills, 1779 and 1821. Mm -hmm. And I've read a number of historians who say either the first and especially the second specifically exclude uh, African American free people. And uh, I was going to write this myself of the second bill. Uh, I was, and Jeff actually read it and said, have you actually read the bill? <laughs> and uh, I then checked it. So I, I couldn't believe anyone would you know, set this without the uh, evidence. And he was right. And then he also pointed me to the uh, Jefferson's letter to pheasants, which was mm -hmm. dismissed by others as a blow off. But actually, it's a very serious correspondence with this Quaker abolitionist in the 1790s, in which he's very emphatic that the bill does not exclude African Americans. He said, of course, given the prejudices of the legislature on whites, they probably will. But he, he actually argues it would be better to have intermixed racial schools than separate black schools, which was what Pheasants was pushing, mm -hmm. which is bizarre, again, given his views on race and right. one of the contradictions. Yeah. We're pretty well out of time unless someone is very keen to ask a question. I, I always go for the hour. Uh, Peter always accused me of being anti-intellectual <laughs> by <laughs> shutting off. I always said it's much better to stop while it's exciting. Uh, there, are clearly, there are clearly lots of questions. Besides, I'm ready for my drink. <laughs> I really want to thank, again, those of you who traveled far, including Peter. It's great to see Ben and Rob uh, and others, uh, and to know we've got a lot of friends also uh, listening online. And of course, we're especially grateful to you, who's come the greatest uh, <laughs> distance. Uh, and what a marvelous launch of what we hope will be a continuing series on uh, Leonard. Uh, and we hope that there won't be such a, an interruption in future caused by pandemics. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.